Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture 16 of applied ergonomics. In the last lecture, we were discussing uh, the topic of uh, motivation, particularly motivation ergonomics and the various theories associated with uh, maintaining a level of motivation among uh, human components associated with any work system. So, typically we describe theories related to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which would give, uh, which would establish a certain progression uh, in a pyramidal manner from basic needs all the way to uh, the self actualization needs. We also talked about the Herzberg's theories of uh, uh, classifying every sort of job into uh, a, a satisfier or a dissatisfier and then uh, allow the extrinsic factors or the intrinsic factors to determine um, the various uh, sort of uh, contents of the work enabling uh, the, the subjects or let us say the human factors to perform at a certain level of motivation. We also uh, talked about the McGregor's x and y theory, uh, where with a negative or a positive approach you can view uh, the uh, worker participation or the human factors participation in any work system. Uh, of significant mention was the fact that nowadays organizations are generally tending to use the theory y, uh, which talks about uh, more uh, ownership or more participation in uh, a certain level of decision making process uh, all the way to the uh, smallest job uh, provider or service provider to a chain of uh, tasks or jobs listed for that particular organization. So, today we will be uh, more interested to delve into a slightly uh, different area, which is about job satisfaction. And uh, basically you can say that uh, job satisfaction really is uh, once uh, sort of mental state of contentment associated with the work that a person delivers. Uh, the typical statement of a satisfied person uh, who is working in a work system and he is a human subject would be I feel good about my job. Okay, I like to work uh, and I would like to do this because I feel good. So, it is actually uh, more an individual feeling about the work content that is given for a particular individual in a certain work system and obviously, um, the job satisfaction and morale are kind of interlinked. They are more or less uh, uh, having a very strong degree of uh, relationship. So, morale is really about the mental and emotional sense of common purpose felt by a group about tasks that lie ahead. Uh, there may be tasks where uh, not one, but many would participate together to accomplish a goal or a common task. And therefore, if uh, it is a group activity, where there are more than one stakeholders involved in the group, uh, even if uh, the jobs are quite hard in nature or they are slightly difficult, still if there is this feeling of go getterness, which is there among the participants of the group, then one can actually accomplish the task in a more and better and appropriate manner. So, uh, Typically, morale can be defined as the mental and emotional sense of common purpose uh, felt by a group which is bound by some tasks lying ahead. Uh, and uh, the basic statement there would be that the morale lifter would typically sound like we can succeed despite the hardships that stand before us. Okay. So, this is something like uh, a sort of a direct derivatized form of the psyche or of the group or the emotion associated with the group to accomplish something. So, if the morale is very high, then there is a um, very big possibility that the job could be accomplished in time at the right quality uh, and vice versa. So, therefore, job satisfaction and morale are kind of going hand in hand in any work system, because if typically the workers are quite satisfied with the job ambience, the job environment, the job description that they have, the job content that is there intended for them, then their morale is completely on the higher side. And even if there is slight changes in terms of the hardships that they would face or some variations, still their go getterness to do something would be uh, completely um, 
persistent and it will help uh, to achieve the central theme, the task, you know, the work which is ahead. So, uh, let us look at some uh, indices for what can be considered to be job satisfaction and maybe these are you can say signatures for uh, the human psyche which determines what could be possibly uh, uh, a satisfactory environment for a certain job uh, or a certain task. So, so typically uh, job satisfaction and high morale could be associated with uh, high productivity of a work system. So, everything goes in order, there is no quality issue or there are no lapses at any place, whatever is being produced, whatever is being delivered, whatever is being intended by a work system gets done uh, in a timely manner, the right quantity, right quality. Uh, then also there is high quality of products and services which are again uh, signs of job satisfaction and high morale. Uh, good safety record, there are hardly any accidents if uh, uh, on a work system which can indicate that there is generally an overall job satisfaction level and a high morale of uh, undergoing tasks. Uh, there is general respect for company, property and policies. This again is a very important factor which would give you a signature indicating that people are generally satisfied, they have a high morale of working. Uh, low labor turnover and low absenteeism are again two very critical issues. So, these are sort of yardsticks or parameters or signatures through which a work system can be categorized to have a relatively high morale among its human subjects and relatively higher level of job satisfaction among the human subjects. Uh, you can also uh, see what happens on the other side, what are the signatures associated with when there is general dissatisfaction with work or low morale. So, there can be very, very low productivity and a higher cost which indicates that people are not really happy about working or doing something. Poor quality of products and services, this is again another very interesting uh, you know sign of job dissatisfaction. Uh, the injury rate or the accident rates could increase typically because they are not happy. So, they will not be in their good state of mind and they will do something which is non-compliant and they will do something which is unsafe and it may lead to higher levels of injuries or accidents. Uh, there can be generally poor housekeeping, all the material handling issues, uh, materials not available at the right time because they are kept somewhere and cannot be uh, traced at the time when they are needed. So, these are all indicators of people are generally dissatisfied or they have a low morale <coughs> of working in a certain task structure. Also, there can be cases of sabotage of company property uh, including life and limb loss sometimes because of such sabotage, people may burn down things or people may be angry or mob. Uh, people in the administration. So, that again is indicative of a high dissatisfaction level among the uh, human subjects, you know, associated with the work system. There can be high labor turnover or high absenteeism from time to time, just to jeopardize the overall routinized processes behind the functioning of the work system, which can also be again indicated. So, these are some signatures which would indicate if people are generally satisfied or generally dissatisfied about a certain job that they are performing. The other issue which I would like to mention is uh, the job specialization and in fact, uh, this is uh, very important uh, in terms of an organizational principle uh, where you will see that uh, there are some workers which will specialize in a limited range of tasks and uh, typically specialization again if you look at the principles of organization design or structural design, I think I had just illustrated it a few lectures back. Job specialization could also be a basis of creating an organization structure. You group together people with similar kind of skill sets or specializations together for a certain end goal or a certain part of the work associated with the work system. So, so when we talk about job specializations, uh, we need to recognize that the work content is uh, simple, uh, task time is short and it may result in high efficiency and productivity uh, if we wanted to use job specialization as a, uh, as a principle of categorizing or classifying the tasks uh, into groups. So, uh, it does not have its own shortcomings however, uh, it is not that specialization based uh, allocation of manpower into different tasks would always result in uh, high level of productivity or efficiency. because. Uh, this can always be viewed negatively by some workers who say that some uh, specific few who have uh, good relations with you know uh, higher ups or good relations with administrative controllers would get easier tasks by 
uh, virtue of the specialization. So, the specialization is negatively connotated and looked into as something which is uh, given as a favor to a group of individuals uh, by saying that they are specialized. So, they are doing this kind of task. Okay. So, and then also specialization has some other shortcomings including if it is too specialized and the organization structure is designed on the principle of specializations, there may not be much job rotation. So, if a certain uh, uh, worker or a human subject is specialized in doing let us say or in applying paint to an automotive, he necessarily may not be a good fit into repair uh, of uh, parts or components. Uh, so, at the most what one can do is can uh, sort of trace uh, this person back into the paint repair issues or issues related to post uh, assembly defects which are generated because of paint peel off etcetera. But then uh, completely changing domain from paint into assembly or weld structures may not be a very good idea. So, therefore, sometimes it becomes very routine you know what a person or a worker is doing uh, a routine definitely brings boredom uh, lack of appeal and then also if uh, jobs are highly specialized and they are not able to have a criss cross flare. Uh, this always results in a situation where you cannot reward because something which has been planned for a certain set of people who are specialized in a certain area depending on the requirement of the task generated by a system okay, would initiate them to work. So, if the work generally is routine in that area then there was no question of higher productivity or higher efficiency because everything is in a balance okay, and so there are hardly any um, shortcomings. Uh, in the process and everything appears to be very, very routine or standard. However, if there is a case where certainly uh, there is a challenge in some area of a particular product or let us say an organization where manpower needs to be shifted and some people are cross trained to work on and they leave their specialization domains to go into another area and then work, they are definitely considered to be very productive and highly efficient. Uh, worker. So, these are some negative connotations associated with job specialization uh, as a, as a uh, organizational principle, structuring principle and therefore, there are certain alternatives which uh, are there to job specializations. For example, one can look into job enlargement and I am going to um, treat these subjects individually in the following slides. One can look into enriching one's job by giving some level of decision making control. You are doing a task associated with let us say fitment of a uh, certain uh, component onto the assembly line of a vehicle and uh, as a worker you know that this assembly has a flexible system where there are many models and there is a mixed model production. So, so, maybe you can have a decision making related to planning of materials which would go into your workstation and through your workstation onto the vehicle for the different models in advance. So, if you know that in today's particular shift there would be 30 different variants it might just uh, give a better sense for an operator to look into the material availability near him and plan that there are exactly 30 different components uh, of different types being fitted into these vehicles. And if supposing at the beginning of the shift he feels that those materials are not available, then he can always raise an alarm to give his impression that yes, I have a decision making authority okay, for a certain uh, uh, sort of job to be entrusted to me. So, you basically assuming more responsibilities. So, that system runs smoothly and it can be a question of again motivating the worker uh, it can be a question of again rewarding the worker if such kind of problems happen on a routine basis. So, you are enlarging the job or uh, sorry enriching the job on a vertical level okay, by giving or piggybacking more and more responsibilities. A person who is an operator on assembly line after fitment of a product checks and inspects about uh, something that he has done and maintains a record. So, this is an additional duty that he is assuming in terms of uh, enrichment of his job uh, the task that he is otherwise carrying out. So, some organizations and in some cases uh, because of the stringent quality norms available with the industry people will look at such enrichment uh, tactics across a variety of tasks which would help you to augment and go the take the process towards six sigma based controls and high quality. <coughs> so, then of course, there can be another alternative of rotating people into various specializations. So, here there is a question of training and there is a question of learning curve associated with human factors because obviously, if a human being is specialized to undertake a certain task and he supposing changes the task um, and it, he has to again deliver at full efficiency a completely different task. So, not all people are meant to be trained for that people may have extremely um, 
you know variant learning responses or learning curves and ones who have faster responses may be more adaptable to such rotation rather than ones who are uh, less uh, in terms of their learning abilities. So, therefore, there is a question of screening not everybody can be rotated, but a few can be rotated, but then you are going uh, you know out of the domain of job specializations when you introduce such tactic tactics of job enlargement, job enrichment and job rotation. So, let us look at individually what they uh, mean. So, as I told you that job enlargement typically would mean a horizontal increase in the number of activities included in the work. Uh, but the activities are still of the same level or type. For example, instead of the worker assembling only one component or one part into a product module, he is responsible for assembling all the components which are there in a certain module. So, in a way he is trying to get an extended set of tasks, but he is getting responsible behind a certain assembly that he is making for a certain product. So, you are enlarging one's job uh, module to give them that respect or command or let us say um, you know an ownership behind the product that he is producing. So, job enlargement typically is done with that purpose. Obviously, there is going to be a time distribution. It is not that if the total time available to the worker is x, you can give him something which is 2x or 3x. So, uh, it has to be time balanced, but then you can give him stakeholding at different levels where he feels an ownership of what he is doing within the same time frame that he is supposed to do. Okay. So, that is job enlargement. There can be job enrichment which is about vertical increase in the work content. I think I mentioned sufficiently about this area. Worker plans, he sets up his machinery, produces, he inspects, you know all these things associated with his basic task are appendages for which he is allowed to have time. So, that is how you enrich his job. Okay. So, just right, just rather than producing just parts, he is making different aspects associated with producing those parts also as a part of his responsibility. So, vertical increase in work content, so that scope and responsibilities increase and then of course, job rotation where training is performed of several different tasks, but each task is a relatively simple one, similar tasks associated with the job specialization. So, example could be that assembly line worker is trained to perform tasks at different work stations okay, or uh, the job becomes more interesting, uh, probably increases worker self esteem. So, uh, you are trying to do some rotation on the uh, local level by introducing this term cross training, which refers to a situation where a worker is uh, trained into several different tasks, at least of the similar type or similar nature. So, let us look at diagrammatically how you will represent this. So, this actually is the simple job specialization approach, one person doing task A. Another approach here, right here is job enrichment, where you are uh, within the same time limit giving a variety of tasks at different levels, so that he is generally feeling a ownership about uh, the product that he is manufacturing. Of course, the task A, B, C, D and E combined together should be the same as the time of the worker who is responsible for fitting or assembling things into a product. Uh, enrichment where there is a vertical level growth, so you have planning inspection along, along with the task A being implemented and rotation where you are actually carrying out three tasks in a rotated manner. So, person is specialized in three domains by training and getting additional inputs. So, he is having more ownership or stakeholding. So, when we talk about the McGregor's theory why about workers are generally positive or human factors are generally positive and they need to be sufficiently motivated to work. This in fact, job rotation gives you a positive impetus because uh, it helps you to develop more ownership privileges and more decision making kind of abilities okay, uh, among the, uh, the smallest stakeholders of any work system, which in a way is very motivating in nature. So, that is how you can categorize the different aspects uh, or alternatives available, I mean alternatives available to job specialization. Uh, let us look at uh, what, what does uh, you know the social aspect of an organization do at work. So, I would call this topic the social organization at work. So, uh, obviously, work serves an important social function. Uh, uh, we all realize that people go to their jobs uh, and work with other people, socialize with them, make new friends, establish relationships. Uh, they can also have certain uh, choices, you know, in terms of uh, let us say grouping together as belonging to the same region or same place or same language. You know, they can also have uh, many uh, kind of groupings you know including people belonging to the same set of tasks together who are regularly interacting with each other on a task mode. So, there are various possibilities which would emerge when we look at the social aspects when such task structuring is being done 
and uh, obviously the uh, whole uh, uh, need for all this socializing comes from the basic human need who has a desire to associate with members of the same species okay so generally um, this is a very common behavior among all human subjects that uh, they would like to flock in groups of people who are associated with either same set of activities or same something which they feel uh, to be very important to get connected. And so therefore, uh, they generally uh, would like to belong to a group, they would uh, like to be accepted by the group on a social basis and of course, there is a need based psyche which is there, the need based psyche directly coming from Maslow's hierarchy of needs or even Herzberg's theory that uh, the, the reason why they would like to associate in this manner in group is that in a way there is a uh, on one hand a fear that if something happens wrong then uh, it is it is a shared uh, sort of you know blame that falls on everybody okay or on the other hand they also feel that they can do better so you know if you look at both the theories or of, of the negative and the positive motivation they could do better if they come together as group and be well for performing in the others who are otherwise working individually. Okay. So, these are the reasons why the socialization within an organization starts to take place. Of course, it will have many connotations, some of them would be completely negative, some of them would be positive, but then uh, one has to realize that we are talking about human subjects and there is of course, a social aspect associated whenever there are social, uh, uh, whenever there are human subjects. So, I would like to share this small uh, Hawthorne studies. Uh, which were done way back in 1924 at the Western Electric Company near Chicago, um, which talks about how environmental factors could be also considered in designing something which leads to job satisfaction or motivation. So, this is one of the first times that such an experiment was conducted and it was about lighting, that if there is proper lighting or effective lighting in a particular place, a place is brighter, uh, which serves as a work, uh, you know, area, the productivity or the, uh, let us say, the even uh, the efficiency at which work can get carried out would be definitely uh, changing because of such brightness introduced or illumination introduced. So, this was one of the uh, cases which showed that how the environment of uh, set setup of a work system is associated with giving enough motivation to people or enough satisfaction to people, so that they can perform better uh, on a higher productive scale. So, in this particular category, uh, the initial objective was to determine the effect of lighting on productivity and worker fatigue. Uh, experiments were conducted, measured production output of two worker groups, a control group and a test group, where one was given um, or basically a uh, brightly illuminated environment and the, uh, the other was given the, the routine environment. Okay, and what typically happened is that the output increased in case the uh, the illumination level was increased. Okay, so um, one of the reasons why the output increased was that uh, workers were made to feel very important by participating in a study. So that is one aspect. The other is that they became interested uh, in these experiments, and uh, of course the social environment. Uh, was also recognized as an important factor to work that people who were working together with the cause of uh, you know uh, coming together for the purpose for the need, for the purpose of the experiment to uh, to happen they kind of behaved together or similar uh, so that they could have enhanced productivity okay so from the control group which was otherwise having a uh, lower level of illumination in workplace to the uh, the the work groups the two work groups which were cons constituted, uh, you, you find that there is a remarkable increase just by this idea of getting together into a, a group to uh, do some observations, some experiments, that there is an increase in the overall productivity level. So, I think I would like to close uh, this uh, here, this lecture here in the interest of time, but uh, in the next lecture, I would typically look at aspects related to job evaluation, how uh, jobs can be graded and evaluated into various categories. Uh, so, that we can have uh, the next level of decision making, which is about weight structure and determination of such structures. So, thank you very much uh, for attending to this lecture.